in the hierarchy of aircraft carriers, India's first indigenously designed and built INS Vikrant may be of a modest size, but its impact on the country's maritime defense reach is going to be of considerable consequence. Thirteen years after the keel of the Vikrant was laid in 2009, it was inducted formally into the Indian Navy by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on August 2nd. Notwithstanding its relatively small size, the INS Vikrant not only fulfills the Indian Navy's long-felt need for a second aircraft carrier, but proves the country's growing expertise in building massive warships. Before the induction of the Vikrant, India had only one aircraft carrier, the refurbished Soviet-era INS Vikramaditya, bought in 2004. At 43,000 tons, the $3 billion INS Vikrant is the largest warship designed and built by India and opens doors for a next bigger one. During the design and the manufacture of the Vikrant, India has ended up gaining expertise in producing special-grade steel needed for such warships, apart from helping hundreds of other smaller industries. Although at 100,000 tons, America's behemoth, the U.S.'s Gerald Ford, is the world's largest aircraft carrier, and China is fast catching up with its next, the 80,000-ton Fujian. The Vikrant gives India a reasonable naval capacity for now. To understand the aircraft carrier's importance, Mayang Chai report spoke to Uday Bhaskar, one of India's most respected defense and strategic experts, president of the think tank Society for Policy Studies, and a retired Navy Commodore. At uh, 43,000 tons, the INS Vikrant is the largest warship designed and built by India. But in the hierarchy of aircraft carriers, it's considered relatively small. How does it reinforce India's maritime defense power in your judgment? Well, first of all, Mike, thank you for inviting me to join you in this conversation. And you're right, at 43,000 tons, the Vikrant would be described as a modest sized aircraft carrier, primarily because the big league is at about 90 to 100,000 tons. The United States, of course, is the lead player in this domain. And with more than 10 aircraft carrier, carrier battery groups, as they're called, it dominates the maritime spectrum. A propos aircraft carrier capability. So if you see that as the benchmarking, 43,000 tons is relatively modest, but it is significant. It is significant in relation to the geography of the Indian Ocean, which is the primary maritime theater for India in terms of its own national security interests. And yes, the Vikrant is a significant punctuation for India not just the Indian Navy, largely because of the kind of trans-border military capability that it represents when the carrier reaches its optimum operational profile in terms of the air power or the fighter component that it will embark. That's not happened now. So the Vikrant is still a work in progress. So if you look at the geography of the Indian Ocean and the geopolitics of the Indian Ocean, India is the only country that has a modest but very professional, very credible Navy. And it has to deal with certain challenges, primarily as represented or posed by China. And we are aware that China has a very clear agenda when it comes to the entire Indo-Pacific, not just the Indian Ocean. And that is one of the issues that India has to keep in mind when it is acquiring such capability. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned China because uh, we are just a, maybe a couple of years, a year and a half away from uh, China coming up with the Fujian, which is 80,000 ton displacement. Uh, it already has Shendong, which is what, 60,000 now? Yeah, with, about these two aircraft, 60, yeah. with these two aircraft carriers uh, in China, uh, what are India's strategic challenges? Well, India's primary strategic challenge is that, you know, when we invest in a Navy, it is never aimed at a single country. No country, including the United States, 
which as I said is the lead player, builds or acquires a navy for a single point threat. So to that extent, India is investing in its navy as one of the options to acquire trans-border national power, uh, military power, in this case in the maritime domain, which is the Indian Ocean. And what naval power does is to establish or maintain what is called as presence as and when required in any part of the Indian Ocean. Right. And this presence can be mathematically explained as presence equals sustainability multiplied by reach multiplied by ordnance or firepower. So there are three elements. So the aircraft carrier gives you an option whereby this particular carrier can cover a radius of about 7,000 nautical miles. It can also stay at sea for extended periods once it has tankers to provide it fuel and its own protection screen, which means other ships that will provide the anti-submarine screen and other functions that carrier battle groups actually go to sea with. And finally, it brings to bear considerable ordnance by way of its fighter aircraft. So anywhere in a 24-hour timeline, if you can see, the Indian aircraft carrier can bring to bear aircraft carrier uh, air power in a radius of about 500 kilometers, about 400 to 450 nau nautical miles in a fairly competent and sustainable manner. So that is what the aircraft carrier represents. Now, against this backdrop, the reason why India needs to maintain a credible naval presence is because there are other countries which also have an interest in the Indian Ocean. Not all of them are like-minded in terms of their interests. China is a good example. Whether it is Galwan on the land border or China's actions in other parts of the Indian Ocean littoral, whether it's a Pakistan or whether it's a Sri Lanka or a Myanmar, are deemed to be detrimental to India's overall national security interests. So that is the reason why India needs to have a credible presence to induce, to compel, to persuade all the other major countries that have navies to play by a certain rule book. And that, I think, is the Indian object. Uh, is, is it your judgment at all that uh, at some point soon, India will have to start preparing for a, maybe a bigger aircraft carrier? And since, the, since the turnaround time is at least a decade, uh, the Vikram took about 13 years. Uh, do you think it may be wise to start doing it now? No, that's a great question. I hope the whole Indian Navy is watching this program of your <laughs> mind and they'll be glad you asked this question because you're absolutely spot on there that since independence, you know, we are not talking about India at 75, but India's early naval planners by the time we came into the early 50s had actually envisioned what we call as a balanced Navy with one aircraft carrier on either seaboard, which is the Western seaboard which is Mumbai, Karwar now. And on the east, we have Vishakapatnam, Andaman, Nicobar Islands. So to have one operational carrier 24-7, it would be desirable for India to have four aircraft carriers at the bare minimum. So I would say that a follow-on to the Vikram, there already is a name, the Vishal. Mm. It would be very desirable if the government of India provides the necessary funding support at the earliest. Because the kind of traction that Cochin Shipyard has acquired in building the Vikram should be maintained, sustained, given the buoyancy it requires, so that we work on the Vishal. Hopefully, the Vishal should be closer to 70, 75,000 tons, which would be better than the Vikram. And also, we can compress the timelines. That's a big challenge. You're right. We can't afford to have 13 years from keel to commissioning for an aircraft carrier. Uh, one of the offshoots of the Vikram project has been, as you have pointed out, India is finding success in metallurgical competence because uh, aircraft carriers require a special kind of steel. The original plan was to perhaps import, but India went ahead and created its own steel for this. Talk a bit about that. Well, that's one of the mini feathers when we talk about the Vikram. Because if you recall the saga of the Vikram, as we now have it, the second Vikram, if you remember, India's first aircraft carrier 
which we acquired from the Royal Navy was 1961. And we had actually named it the first Vikram. So in a way, for people of my generation, you know, it's very nostalgic yeah. to see the same pennant number, Romeo 11, R11 was the call sign for the old Vikram. And now you see it for the new Vikram. And when it was designed, it was expected that the Russians would provide the necessary support, beginning with the steam. But there were a variety of reasons whereby this did not work out. So I think India took a very important decision. This was when Dr. Manmohan Singh was the prime minister, that we would go ahead and actually make our own steel, which meant a certain amount of R&D. And to the credit of all the major Indian players in the public sector and in the private sector, we were able to pursue and arrive at the right grade of steel that you need. As you said, warships, aircraft carriers in particular need a special grade. And we found the ability to manufacture that kind of steel. And that was the reason why we perhaps spent a couple of years from 2006 to about 2008 before the final go ahead could be given to say that India will make its own steel. That's how the keel was laid in 2009. I think we could have done this carrier in a decade, 10 or 11 years, but unfortunately, COVID hit us. Right. And that was a very difficult, I would say, challenge. And to the credit of Cochin Shipyard and its entire workforce, the Indian Navy and its design bureau, and all the other MSMEs, the medium and small scale enterprises that were contributing, were able to, in a way, I think, surmount the COVID challenge and still have the ship ready in time for India at 75. So amongst the many, what I would call as mini feathers that we associate with the Vikrant cap, right. steel is definitely one of them. Indigenization of warships has been a slow but uh, steady process in India starting, I think, in the 1970s with, as you pointed out in my earlier interview with you, the Leander yeah. uh, with the UK. And then yeah. it was followed by the Godavari class. Uh, now we are at the Vikrant. How do you assess uh, this uh, uh, progress so far? Actually, I would say it's a matter of great satisfaction and pride for India and for the Indian Navy in particular, because as you rightly pointed out, the first ship that we were able to warship that we were able to build in India was the INS Nilgiri, which was 1972, which was based on a Royal Navy, a Leander class frigate. Right. And we brought it here, we manufactured it. We also did a little bit of tweaking of the design to make it compatible for Indian waters. And from there onwards, I would say it's been a steady uptick. The India's, the Indian Navy's design bureau was able to arrive at higher levels of competence. We were able to move from the Leander to the Godavari class, which is an Indian design. It has a number of features which are very quote unquote Indian. And from there, we moved on to a higher tonnage, the Delhi class. And the real breakthrough for India, if I may point out, Mayank, is the fact that we were able to design and build our own SSBN. That is a submarine, a nuclear propelled submarine that is capable of carrying ballistic missiles. That's a very right. high level of technological competence and design competence. And India was able to do this. And what is remarkable is that every country that has gone down this path, including the United States of America, initially invested and acquired certain levels of competence in what is called as the SSN. That is just a nuclear propelled boat without the ballistic missile. Then they scaled up, introduced the ballistic missile, and they arrived at the SSBN. India had the confidence to say, we will go straight for the SSBN. Let me add that we did get support from the Russians because this is the first time for us. So for the Indian Navy, we have demonstrated credibility, competence in warship design and building from the Nilgiri to the Vikrams today. We also had a breakthrough in the SSBN. But I must be honest and add that we have not been able to find that level of competence in making conventional submarines. So these are the anomalies for India. I mean, one of the glaring anomalies, India imports Kalashnikov rifles. That's yeah. a personal thing. It's not particularly complex when you look at submarine ships and so on. But yet the Indian ecosystem has not been able to design and manufacture a personal weapon that would be on par with the global standard. 
and so these are the anomalies in india's pursuit of aatmanirbharta or yeah. indigenous effort. you know i'm i'm uh, fascinated you pointed out the kalashnikov uh, a, a, a country can design a, a highly complicated complex machine like an aircraft carrier and still uh, has either chosen or not been able to design a personal weapon of the kind for soldiers these are anomalies i mean i want to say this up front this is also a reflection of i would say inadequate strategic acumen i say in terms of india's higher defense and the professionals who contribute to the decision making and we had invested in these public sector units the defense public sector units and i'm afraid their track record has been uneven hmm. and i think the indian political leadership has also not been as astute as they ought to have been because perhaps they don't understand military power you know this is a country that if you remember mayank i think you are old enough in the on the beat to remember the HF-24, the Marut. Right. In Bangalore, HAL designed and produced, again, of course, with German help. There was a German designer. In the early 60s, mid 60s, we had a fighter aircraft that was very credible, very affordable. But we dropped the ball. Yeah. Instead of building on the HF-24, and this is what I often say is one of the anomalies and the kind of, uh, I would say, lack of sagacity in higher defense decision making in India. And by the way, re we repeated this. Right. We gave up on the HF-24 on Rajiv Gandhi's watch when he was the prime minister. We had invested, the Cold War was still on, this is the late 1980s. We had invested with the West Germans in acquiring what was a very good submarine for its time, the HDW. So right. from then West Germany, we had contracted for four of them. And we said we would have them built in India in Mazagon docks in Mumbai, Bombay then. And because of a political compulsion, if you remember, there was the HPW Bofors scandal. <laughs> yes. The government of India, in a feckless manner, closed the whole line. We had invested in personnel, in creating a whole line for building submarines in the late 80s. Right. And all that investment went down the tubes. And this highly trained technical staff were finding jobs in Australia to build the Australian boat in Dubai to work with the oil and you know other kind of infrastructure industries there. Some went abroad to the United States or North America. Again, this is a poor reflection on India's higher defense decision making entire apparatus. So right. these are the anomalies of India. Yeah. The rough. Uh some rule for aircraft carriers is, as you have uh, told me, is for every thousand tons, there is an aircraft. Uh, at 45,000, uh, the Vikrant has about 30. Uh, the Fujian will probably have about 60 or so. The USS, USS Gerald Ford, which is the largest carrier in the world at 100,000 tons, has 75. My question is, how important do you think is the number of aircraft in a world which is increasingly dependent on high-end technology which perhaps make all this redundant well i would say that much depends on the type of aircraft the quality of the aircraft will determine the quantity so when you talk about for instance the u.s carrier at a hundred thousand tons the gerald ford right they have about 90 aircraft because it's a mix between the fixed wing aircraft okay. and the helicopter so between that, you know, you arrive at this figure of one aircraft, whether it's fixed wing or rotary wing, which is a helicopter for every thousand tons. In the Indian case, we would be able to embark about 40 aircraft on the Vikram. Hmm. Again, maybe there would be 30 fighters so that the other 10, 12 are made up by the rotary wing, the helicopters. Now, the real challenge for India is that, yes, today drones precision guided missiles, all of them pose a threat to a platform like an aircraft carrier. But then an aircraft carrier also has its own protection. It's not as if it's going, you know, without any other, shall we say, a kind of shield when it goes out onto the open seas and wherever it is required. But the vulnerability factor has to be accepted. There is an inbuilt vulnerability, frankly, for any platform at sea. So this is the old cat and mouse about land-based aircraft, 
land-based missiles? Can they pick you up? Today, they tell you that satellite technology can read your car plate number. Right. If you have that kind of surveillance capability, can you marry this with ordnance delivery and say that every platform that goes to sea is vulnerable? The answer is no, because an aircraft carrier and its screen will also have various technological capabilities to either deflect or destroy whatever be the ordnance that is being delivered onto it. But yes, they have to live with their vulnerability. There also is an underwater vulnerability. Right. So we are looking at maritime domain awareness, both on the surface, in space, and underwater. And this is really the whole technological challenge of naval power in the decades ahead. And India has to be abreast of all this, just as all the other major navies. And I think the last point I want to make on this is for India, there is an enabling provision, which is that today India is part of the Quad. Right. The Quad has four nations, the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. The senior officials are going to be meeting very soon next week in India. And while the Quad has not yet arrived at a determination about what kind of naval engagement and cooperation they want to identify, my sense is that depending on how they perceive the Indo-Pacific, that is the Indian Ocean and the continuum through the Malacca and other water bodies towards the Pacific, and we have China, we have the South China Sea, we have Japan, Taiwan, ASEAN, all of that. There's a lot of geopolitics going on there. It's very animated. Right. So I think the Quad nations will have to decide how they want to invest in their respective naval slash maritime power surveillance capabilities, both individually and collectively, and to what end, to what objective. And I hope China comes on board because the entire expectation is that you must play by the rules. And right. at the moment, China is bucking the system. So that is really the sum and substance of where we want to be. Just last couple of things. You have written today that critical components of the INS Vikrant, such as the propulsion package and the aviation component are largely imported. And at the low end, we have it achieved a great deal of indigenization, but at the high end that you point out, uh, there isn't. And you're calling for a degree of self-reliance. What kind of steps do you think the Indian Navy uh, would require to achieve that? Well, first of all, let me place this in context. Any warship you know, has three elements in terms of the design and the final operational profile. First is to make the vessel float. The second is to make the vessel move. And the third is to make it a warship and make it fight. Right. So if you look at these three levels, in terms of flotation and making the hull and making it waterproof and you know bulletproof and missile proof and all of that, the Indian Navy has done well. India has done well. We have touched almost 75 to 80 percent in terms of the indigenous effort. So which is, as I said, a tribute. And we spoke about steel and India's innovation right. there earlier on. When it comes to making this hull move, the propulsion package, we are still dependent on the imported support. And at the moment, for instance, whether it is the engines, the gas turbines from the United States, the gearbox from Germany, there are various other machinery parts that are coming in, which are right. imported. So we have only reached about 45 to 50 percent in terms of the indigenous effort. The rest is coming from abroad. When you look at the fighting component, what makes the carrier a warship, a credible platform? You need aircraft. You need radars. You need communication. You need the whole aviation package. You need the networking. Now, all of this, I'm afraid, up to 80 to 85 percent is imported. Yeah. For instance, we do not have an indigenous aircraft. So at the moment, we are embarking the Russian origin MiG-29K, MiG-29 MiG Kilo. Now, that is not performing up to optimum level for a variety of design reasons. So we are looking at an alternate option. Are we going to, it's been narrowed down to two aircraft, the F-18 of the United States and the Rafael of France. But it's going to be a big decision. It also will need some design tweaks because Vikrant was originally designed for the Indian LCA naval maritime variant. Then we brought the MiG-29K. And suddenly we are talking about an F-18 or a Rafael. 
So even the size and basic issues like the lift that takes you down from the flight deck to the hangar, all of this will have to be accordingly, I think, reviewed to ensure that we can pursue such an option. Right. So these are the challenges for India when we talk about composite self-reliance and Atma Nirbharta in the true sense of the term. So the Indian Navy is aware of this. And the only way we can do it is if India invests in R&D. So I'm afraid no amount of sloganeering and prime minister's statements and defense minister's statements exhorting India to become self-reliant yeah. will work. At the end of the day, it's hard work. It's also India's ability as a nation to invest in R&D. At the moment, if you look at India's overall R&D, it's well, well below the media. And then we have to stay the course. You know, that's the reason why, Mayank, the example of the Kalashnikov. Yeah. The ecosystem is not allowing competence to, frankly, be nurtured. And there are a variety of reasons. For the same reason why, you know, I would say many public sector units and uh, other institutions are not delivering to the optimum level that we seek or that we desire. So these are the challenges that right. we have to address. And to conclude, uh, you also worry about the fact that the fighter aircraft on Vikrant, uh, there are some delays. In, uh, uh, it's not swift enough in your judgment. What kind not of... Enough. I mean, India's decision making is laborious. I mean, if, yes. forget about the Navy, look at the Indian Air Force. One of the, I would say, saddest kind of episodes for me as a security analyst, you know, who's been a student of India's trajectory for the last 25, 30 years, is that we were not able to get a trainer aircraft for our Air Force. So this country has lost precious lives of young pilots because we did not have the right kind of trainer. And that was a decision that was being taken from, if I remember right, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi's watch. We are talking about the early 80s. And finally, it is on Vajpayee's watch that a decision is taken. So it's more than a quarter century. Yes. Now, these are the kind of delays or maybe 20 years, if not quarter century. But these are not, as I said, very positive kind of, uh, shall we say, characteristics right. of decision making in the country. That is why I am a little concerned that we are now with a Vikrant that does not have the kind of air power or the fighter aircraft that it really needs to make it a credible platform to project Indian naval presence, India's transborder military capability in the Indian Ocean. On that mixed note, Uday, uh, grateful as always for your time and obviously remarkable expertise uh, on these subjects. Thank you very much.